This is episode 36 of the Immunology Podcast, Engineering Immune Cell Therapies with Leonardo Ferreria. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Rapp. Welcome back to the Immunology Podcast, where we have conversations with immunologists. The Immunology Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. Today we have Dr. Leonardo Ferreria from the Medical University of South Carolina on the podcast to talk about his research designing and developing engineering immune cell therapies for autoimmune disease, cancer, and aging. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in immunology news coming up, but first... First, we would like to remind our listeners about Cell Therapy News, which is a free weekly newsletter brought to you by Stem Cell Science News, summarizing the latest research, news, jobs, and events in the cell therapy research. Use Cell Therapy News to stay current with the latest uh, cell therapy, gene therapy, and regenerative medicine research. Subscribe at www.celltherapynews.com. How are you doing, Jason? Looking forward to our uh, interview today? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Do you, do you listen to other podcasts besides our very good one that you co-host? So I listen to a good amount of Freakonomics podcasts of the main Freakonomics and, oh, yeah. and uh, No Stupid Questions, which I'm a big fan of. Oh, yes. I love those. I haven't actually listened to Freakonomics lately, but definitely one of the first podcasts I, I listened to, actually. And then, and then I've dived into um, Make Me Smart, which is a marketplace podcast, which I started listening during the pandemic, and that's been pretty good. Those are my mainstays. I do a lot of that when I'm mowing the lawn. Yeah, you got you to keep yourself uh, entertained while cutting the grass. I, I, I commute to, to work, like I go with my bike, so I have also like a half an hour time to, to listen to. I really like, you know, for especially for all people that are lo- wanting to work on their English and listen to nice, the BBC has such nice podcasts, a couple of science related ones. I'm listening to this one now called The Bomb. Uh, is from first of a series about the like the Manhattan Project and, and oh geez. Uh, but like from the view of the scientist it was very very interesting and this second part is actually is the second season talks about uh, this um, spy who was a a German kind of refugee German uh, exile exile from the Nazi times and he was a communist and he was. Uh, all the time, he was a very he was called he was called Carl Fuchs, and he was very a very accomplished physicist. And all the time, he was in the U.S. in the middle of the Manhattan Project, and all that while he was giving all the information to the Soviets all that time. And that's part of why wow. the Soviets could develop their bomb so quickly because he was literally giving them like the blueprints of what he was literally doing in Los Alamos. So fascinating to see they have such nice podcasts at the bbc but well let's continue with this podcast today so why don't you get started you want immunometabolism or immunometabolism oh man i'll take the immunometabolism please all right we will do we will start with a uh, deep dive into lactate okay it's called Carbon Source Availability Drives Nutrient Utilization in CD8 T Cells. Uh, it's in cell metabolism. First author is Iram Kamak, and last author is Russell Jones. It came out on the 17th of August. And this has a couple of interesting things in it. So, one, they say that they, we know that the media we use when we do in vitro experiments is artificial, right? It's Designed to get the cells work, but may not exactly be what there is physiologically. So they have a more physiological medium that they'll use, which is instead of the ID, IMDM, so isocopes modified Dubelco's medium, there's a Van Ander Institute modified isocopes medium, which is also a defined medium that has more po- uh, approximate amounts of the polar uh, metabolite concentrations that are mouse serum. And then you can then add into that, so that's VIM. And then they added into that um, the ones that are highly abundant in mouse serum, but absent from most culture media, so acetate, beta-hydroxybutyrate, citrate, lactate, and pyruvate. So they called these physiological carbon sources, or PCSs. And they wanted to see, basically, at a super high level, how do cells behave when you actually make them physiological at baseline and then under perturbed systems using a... um, I remember this right, a uh, listeria infection model. 
And so what they found is that you don't actually, when you produce new metabolites that are different, you're not having, so going from VIM, so, so going from the standard media, the IMDM to VIM does induce genetic changes in, you know, your standard keg um, RNA-seq pathway search for metabolism. But adding the, the, uh, the standard, these physiologic carbon sources doesn't to either media. So there's a difference between the two main medias. When you throw in the physiological carbon sources, it doesn't change anything. But what they find, and they do a lot of radio tracing, for all of these studies is that lactate is actually preferred um, during infection. So if you put these other carbon sources is use less glucose for the citric acid cycle. And then you have increased function effector function of the CD8 cells downstream. It's not changing the metabolic metabolomic um, transcription genes so it's not like they're upregulating something else but they're more efficient with this and produce d downstream increased effector gene signals and they during listeria infection t cells preferentially in mice consume lactate over glucose and lactate enhances its in the cell's abilities to produce cytokines essentially um if you nuke lactate dehydrogenase you have worse outcomes in uh, listeria infection so this does a couple of things one it says your media is probably altering your experiments which we all know but don't really do anything about we just keep doing the same thing um and then they get into it and in show through again and the way they do this is a bunch of mass spec with radioactive labels on it you essentially affect its ability to be proliferative and have downstream interferon gamma, TNF, and so on. So they call it a physiological fuel, and that and if you get rid of its ability to process lactate, mice have worse outcomes from infection. So that's the first one. I thought that was pretty cool, especially since lactate's viewed as the devil, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's a it's a waste metabolite that you know causes muscle aching. It actually seems to be pretty important. Yeah, I think lactate has been. Uh, gaining recognition lately for the yeah especially for me immunometabolism um of people because there's so much of this uh being produced oh and that it all makes sense that the cells would benefit from being able to use it also t-rex have been also associated with being able to to consume a lot of lactate uh preferentially so i guess this is another another um added evidence of, of the importance of this metabolite. I have a, I have a question. I think I might have missed it when you started. So at what point are the cells, are the mice are fed with this metabolite? No, the, oh, the no cells they, are... they feed, so they'll feed them different things, right? So they can feed them, uh, okay. they can feed them lactate to trace. They'll feed them glucose to trace. What they're seeing is that lactate is preferred over glucose. That's, but that's what they see on the mice when and they And in infect. the cells. Yeah. And the cells. But are lactate these... is a preferential fuel source during infection. Okay. If you kill lactate dehydrogenase, thus the ability for lactate to enter the citric acid cycle to produce energy, during infection you have worse outcomes. Very interesting. Yeah, and also I think Russell Jones group have this really nice system with um with the isotopes and the, their their ability to really follow uh, the the carbon throughout the the Krebs cycle and glycolysis they is really have they have really uh, worked on this on this whole um, workflow and they have yeah they can make really nice really nice metabolic measurements with them. All right, um, moving forward from uh, immune immunometabolism before going back in, in your second paper, I'm going to talk about. Another very uh, interesting uh, field, which is vaccination, uh, not against COVID, although yay for uh, Omicron specific vaccines that are coming apparently, uh, let's see if they help. Um, this is about a vaccination for a different disease that I think unfortunately doesn't get, I don't know, doesn't get enough attention or we're just too slow to get through uh, with proper advances, which is malaria. 
Um, so this paper was published in Immunity. It's called Vaccination with a Structure-Based Stabilization Version of the Malarian Antigen PFS 48-45. elicits ultra-potent transmission-blocking antibody responses. And first author, Brandon, Mac Brandon McLeod, McLeod from the lab of Jean-Philippe Julien at the University of Toronto. And uh, I, I really like this publication. I really like everything that has to do with, you know, diseases that sometimes are uh, ignored or they're diseases of a lot of people, such as malaria. Um, and I was very interested in this paper because I had also followed a little bit the development and the initial uh, clinical trials on a different malaria vaccine, um, namely the RTSSAS01, which was, I think, was a hot topic. Uh, well, I think almost like five, five, seven years ago, when it was the the clinical uh, trial was being run, and it was actually a little bit of a disappointment. Uh, so this vaccine, which targets a antigen from the what is known as the circumspersite uh, protein from the sporocyte uh, of of uh, Plasmodium falciparum, which is one of the one of the most important for for malaria. Um, and this sporocyte is the one that kind of gets into the bloodstream from the from the mosquito bite, and that the idea is that you can find blocking antibodies against this particular stage of the parasite. You can prevent infection. Um, this vaccine, the RTS, the, the one, not the one I'm going to talk about, but this other one took 30 years to develop, so it was been, been in development since like 1987. As which shows how slow some uh, vaccine development can take, even though the need for a vaccine against malaria is, is enormous. So many people around the world have it, uh, have problems with the disease, especially children. And this vaccine, so the problem with this vaccine was that phase three testing actually was quite disappoint disappointing. Uh, children can only, this only works for children, only gives some protection for children. Children must be vaccinated very young, between, uh, I think, f five to seven months. They need to receive four doses of the vaccine, and the efficacy in the end uh, was about 30, like 36%. Uh, so it was actually not great, better than nothing, but not great. And also it's hard. The, the logistics are hard, having to get a, such an early um, yeah, injection is, is not, it's not easy. And so the author is talking about, they, 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 they approach this as thinking, can we target something else? Is there, if we look at people that have been infected with malaria, what kind of antibodies are they making? What are, what are their antibodies recognizing the malaria parasite? And so they, they think that they can combine, which is uh, no, maybe the, the, the little immunity they can get from this other vaccine with a different vaccine that blocks transmission, that blocks uh, for, that you can infect the mosquito with malaria, so the malaria keeps, gets, uh, keeps getting transmitted. And so for this, they're looking at different antigen. Uh, uh, they find a, uh, there's one particular uh, antigen that is uh, highly, uh, highly targeted in immune responses, which uh, is present in the, gam in the surface of the uh, gametes of the, of the parasite. And this is PFS 4845 which is a glycophosphatidinositol-linked protein and is basically kind of the later stage of the parasite inside your blood and then gets taken by the mosquitoes. So what they look is they look at the, this, this uh, one particular domain of this protein, which is a six, they call 6C domain, and they, they, want, they want to uh, modify this protein in a, in a kind of a very directed manner to make it a good protein for vaccination, make it more stable because it's a very large protein. There's issues with the stability of the protein that prevents it kind of to, for being used uh, in, a sim in a simple vaccine approach. So they look uh, very closely into the how this, this uh, protein is, is bound by this one particular nu uh, neutralizing antibody that they have identified previously, which is known uh, as TB31F. and they. What they do is they find, they characterize the epitope and the surface, the 
the residues that are stabilized in the epitope, so they're inside and outside the epitope, and they predict uh, residues and um, um, Anti, anti, uh, sorry, um, amino acid residues outside the epitope that would improve the stability of the protein without, uh, without interfering with the actual epitope and the binding of a um, antibody to that area. And so, you know, and this is a very large, kind of a nice, very best paper on structural biology. And basically, they find uh, they by changing different antibodies, they actually find. Uh, particular uh, mutations that really s substantially improve the the stability of the, the protein, they reduce the aggregation, uh, making it a better uh, vaccine candidate. And they test this. They test this, this uh, engineered versions of this of this domain. They do um, immunization, and they also introduce to a uh, platform which makes immunogenic liposomes. Uh, to, to improve the immune response. And they actually get very nice, uh, uh, very nice results compared with the wild up version of the, if they if you use a vaccine with a wild up version of this protein, their stabilized versions have substantially improved uh, functionality. And even the one, the best performing actually genera uh, generates a complete blocking of transmission. And they have this, uh, this um, assay in which they feed, they like make like a like a kind of a serum um, imitation, and they put uh, mosquitoes and they get them like blood meals. They have like a like a film, like a like a like a membrane, and they have this mix of serum and and blood and and the and the and the parasites, um, and they um, they show that. They can uh, by by having this this um, by using sera from mice that have been uh, what's the word uh, treated with this vaccine, they can block the transmission of the of the uh, gametes that are in the in this blood meal to the mosquitoes almost a hundred percent. So it's, I think it's very interesting because it gives you a, like is a different way of looking at vaccination against malaria, given that it has been so hard to come up with a good protective uh, vaccine so far. This vaccine might be very important in reducing community transmission maybe. And if everyone's vaccinated, then their mosquitoes have nowhere to get con contaminated from. So kudos to, to this uh, different approach. So how long do you think it's going to be until this gets in people? Oh my God, I hope less than 30 years. I don't know. I mean, they don't discuss it in the paper. Um, and I think it's very early stages. Um, so I, I really don't know. And it's so hard because in malaria is so hard to get, I guess this could be easier to test. I don't know. I mean, it's so hard. This, this parasite has been evading, uh, vaccination for so long. I know. Well, it also doesn't like you don't develop permanent antibodies to it normally, right? Like immunization isn't a normal mechanism, right? For managing it in people. N I, I think... I don't think so. No, they have. There's a lot of also. They keep changing their antigens and and, and hiding. Uh, also, they hide inside the cells of your liver. So I don't know. It's it's, it's very difficult to. And they also, I think, they also hide a lot with glycoproteins. They have all these sugars like hiding epitopes. So peekaboo. Yeah. So let's see. Hope maybe maybe uh, a, an a, an advance is coming, but I don't know. All right. I guess it's time for more immunometabolism. Bring it. All right. So here we go. The LACC1, which I'll call LAC1, bridges NOS2 and polyamine metabolism in inflammatory macrophages. First author is Zhang Wei. Last author is Jason Crawford. And co-last author is Richard Flavel. It is a four-author nature paper. It's only four. That's pretty cool. Um, so that's neat to see to start with. So there is a protein known as lacase domain containing one, LAC or LACC1 protein, that's known to be in macrophages. And all these other genetic studies have shown that it is a regular, plays an important regulatory role in IBD, arthritis, clearance of microbial infection, 
there's all these SNP studies and other stuff. And if you knock it out, bad things happen. And no one knows what it does. Um, they know it's in macrophages, but they don't know what it does. So this group came along. And what they did is they took mouse and human. Uh, so they, so they first, they, they looked at the sequences and thought that it should have a, um, uh, copper binding domain based on its structure. But in fact, they found when they isolated, uh, M black one mouse, black one versus vector protein and found that it actually had zinc, not, not copper. So that was surprising. Uh, they took a LAC1 knockout mouse and extract metabolites from um, inflammatory BMDM model cells and then figured that substrates would accumulate in these cells, right? Because they don't have the enzyme to convert them. Then they incubated it with murine LAC1 plus zinc and then used <laughs> ultra-performance liquid chromatography coupled to quadrupole time of flight mass spec. So UPLC QTOF mass spec. Right. Um, and then looked at metabolites and put it on a volcano plot to figure out um, full change versus false discovery rate. And the biggest hit was L ornithine. Uh, L ornithine itself is a metabolite of RL arginine metabolism. I'm just going to start saying instead of the enantiomers, I'm just going to go ornithine and arginine at this point. Otherwise, it's going to get real rough. Um, Normally, arginine is metabolized in macrophages to nitrous oxate, NO, nitrous oxide, which is that important macrophage molecule, right? And citrulline via NOS2. But if you, in IL4 stimulated anti inflammatory macrophages, L arginine is metabolized to L ornithine and urea via arginase. Okay, so why the heck is ornithine so important here? So they used, they put in assays, they put L-arginine in, arginine succinate, L-citrulline, and found that citrulline was the substrate of this LAC1. So they confirmed the stereochemistry, they did all the things, and then they looked at mutant versions of this as well that were known to have damage, that were known to be physiologically relevant, right? Like there's this... Um, there's these disease polymorphisms that they found. So they put those in to the gene as well and tried to see what happened. And they showed that they had indeed worse enzyme kinetics. They did the basic Michaelix Menten kinetics and got the KCAT and the KM and found that the mutants functioned less well. But they found that one, which was correlated with mutations, a mutation associated with disease, actually had improved catalytic efficiency due to better binding, which accelerates the timing of the response to inflammatory macrophages. That's why it comes sooner than normal. Um, and they showed if you chelated away um, the zinc, the enzyme stop functioning or stop functioning as well. So they established that this LAC1 cleaves L-citrulline, L-ornithine. They couldn't find out what the second um, fragment was ba at baseline because of the experimental conditions. It was something small and it was kind of like, you know, being buffered away or immediately converted to something else. So they did um, mass spec with 13 C labeled L citrulline C1 and with uh, heavy water and then did NMR and found that LAC1 is a novel HNCO synthase. So it makes this um, radical carbon source molecule, like molecule HNCO from L-citrulline when it makes L-citrulline and L-ornithine. So, um, and it's conjugate base of sodium cyanate. So they did more work to show that they can, they, they basically used a uh, carbomylation assay to capture it so that you could see it show up in the system. And they did, and they found that. And then they did the mutants and showed that it worked less well. Um, so then they're trying to figure out how this whole thing works. They stimulated cells with LPS interferon gamma, looked at cytokines and BMDMs, and basically showed that LAC1 has an anti inflammatory role at baseline. Um, and then, if you supplemented it with L ornithine, but not the other molecule, that OCN or HOCN, that, that fixed the problem of the lack one 
BMDN knockout, right? So if you supplemented the downstream molecule, you mostly recover the problem. They did tiferium, estiferium infections and showed that um, the mice were lost a lot more weight in the knockout if you gave L-ornithine back orally. They did better, so you didn't have to IP it. You could just put it in their water um, and showed. And so then that is interesting from a therapeutic perspective, right? Because you can eat it. And then they showed that um, the enzyme is also important for polyamine synthesis by mapping out a bunch of pathways and basically show that it's part of the, so, you know, arginine can become ornithine with urea. But this arginine, this NOS, you know, arginine to citrulline, the LAC1 also moves it to ornithine. And then that goes into the polyamine synthesis, which is putrescine, spermidine, and spermine. So normally, L-citrulline is derived from NOS in inflammatory macrophages. They thought that LAC1 would be dependent on NOS2 for its function because NOS2 provides the substrate, which is true. So they knocked out, they, they did the knockouts and crossed in the LAC1 and saw that the, that the NOS2, that the function of LAC1 was dependent on the loss of NOS2, on NOS2, right? And there's no extra loss of function because if you don't have the enzyme, it doesn't matter if you don't have the substrate and vice versa. And if you fed them the substrate, if you fed them the downstream, it worked. So long and short, they map out the whole pathway um, and basically find that this enzyme has a whole new function that no one knew about that basically is an anti-inflammatory shunt from inflammatory signaling in macrophages by converting the downstream inflammatory molecule to the anti-inflammatory one. Is it clear when you said it, what induces the expression of this enzyme? Nope. They don't go into that here. Um, that's other work that they don't really deep talk about. So this, this has been known for a long time because this is not, I guess I don't want to say a long time. This is, this enzyme apparently has been known about for a while, but no one knew what it did. Okay. They saw it as an ex something was expressed in microfilm. Or like, and if you do GWAS studies in human early onset IBD, it's a polymorphism there. And if you knock it out, the mice do badly, but no one knew what it did. Because no one was expecting it to, to synthesize. Ornithine. Right. It converts citrulline to ornithine. Yeah, so they they both things. Well, you have to, right? Like you you Yeah. You know, you're cleaving L citrulline gets cleaved to make ornithine. Okay, so do you think yeah, I guess it gives a different a, a new way of inter of intervening in these pathways if you Well, would. exactly. Well, so for people that have this polymorphism that's associated with disease, you could just give them ornithine. You're right. The missing or anything can be just and that's it. And you can just orally give that because that's absorbed. Interesting. You don't have to inject it. You just give them or anything. Do you think that it would be worth testing in people? Oh, sure. I mean, this is apparently a polymorphism that's associated in human disease. So you okay. find those people that have that genetic quirk. It's a pretty easy trial, right? And you just give yeah. them anything. Okay. Not hard to get oral or anything. Okay, looking forward for the follow up, or, or maybe the the, the startup company they make to to test. I don't test even know if this will be a startup. Like this, this is like, this is one of those that's so easy to do that no drug company. Like, yeah, no drug company would do it. Yeah. Okay, we'll see. So womp, womp. maybe maybe a clinical trial for for the sake of humanity. Okay. Uh, then, uh, for the sake of humanity, I will continue uh, with my second uh, paper of the day before it's too late. So, my second paper, it's also a little bit of a, I would say, a long story, complicated. So, I hope I, I bring it on uh, in an in a understandable manner. But it is about T cells, so I, I think it's very interesting. Uh, the paper is called Signatures of Recent Activation Identify Circulating T-Cell Compartment Containing Tumor-Specific Antigen Receptors with High Avidity, uh, published in Science Immunology. And the first authors are Anna uh, Purkaria and Sebastian Yarosh. Uh, and this is from the labs uh, of Dirk Busch and Kilian Schover at the Technical University of Munich. And in this paper, I think the very nice thing about this paper is, as, is the way they, they go about uh, studying 
the importance of avidity in anti-tumor responses and how difficult it can be sometimes to identify tumor-specific T cells in a polyclonal population of T cells that you find in a patient with cancer. So uh, nowadays, especially given that uh, there's so many opportunities for us to generate transgenic T cells or trying to specifically target mutations on the tumor, for example, new antigens, it is becoming more important to understand which are the T cells from the lot that are actually uh, have a anti-tumoral potential. They're recognizing antigens. And I think there's also a very much interest in recognizing new antigens in contrast to tumor-associated antigens that are uh, coded in the germline because they we expect them to be um, better targets, specifically in comparison to some of the tumor-associated antigens that kind of have more side effects on, to, on target of tumor um, related. So um, one, of the, one of the questions that is not clear because there's a lot of maybe contradicting uh, studies and the, I think there's still a little bit of, of a muddy um, landscape is which are the teasers that you want for, a, for taking over an immune response? Do you want the very high avidity? There's also, because there's some papers that suggest that intermediate or even low avidity might actually also give you a more long uh, immune response. Also, are the cells in the T, if you see a tumor and you see all these T cells that are infiltrating this tumor, they have uh, markers, particularly PD-1 that is highly used to kind of identify T cells that are tumor specific. But then if you see T cells in a tumor, a lot of them have high expression of PD-1. Are they all tumor specific? Are they all recognizing antigens from the tumor? Uh, you see some clones that are expanded and some aren't. Are, is uh, tumor T cell expansion or the, the size of the clone uh, population correlated with the chance of this T cell actually identifying specific tumoral antigens? And there's still a lot of questions all around this, this area. So... In this paper, they 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 try to a uh, reductionist approach, uh, in which they have this a lot of mouse models, in which they have a new specific new antigen, uh, which is OVA, and they um, try to understand what exactly is the they they characterize a lot about the amount of of, of initial T cells that you would need to mount a response. And then to identify whether you can see those T cells as tumor specific later on in the response, and whether the avidity of different TCRs interferes or affects the how these populations look in a in a in a, in a kind of after you have a, a tumor model. So they, I think the most interesting part, they do a lot of kind of groundwork, uh, showing that they can have a model in which. If you have a T cell that has a TCR that is highly has a high avidity for your for your uh, target, like OT1, you can transfer very very few cells, uh, as little as uh, they they show as little as 128 OT1 T cells are sufficient to uh, mediate uh, tumor protection in in this mice. So you already see that that's kind of similar to what you expect the naive repertoire to have of a kind of uh, re polyclonal response against one particular antigen. So uh, I think the most interesting part of their work is that they have a library that they have previously developed in which they have different TCRs. They're all against the synfecal peptide, so the OVA peptide, and that are have different char have characterized different avidity. So they have a group of, of TCRs that have a high avidity, some TCRs that have intermediate avidity, and one TCR that has low avidity, but it is specific against this peptide in the in the right MHC, and they compare the how these different uh, clones um, perform in comparison, and uh, of course they show that in the case of an infection, um, they have so the the avidity of the of the TCR has a uh, positive correlation with uh, expansion of the T cells, of protection. Uh, in this case, they have a listeria model. And 
you need a lot less cells to protect the mice from the listeria infection. So something as 800 cells were sufficient to protect the mice from listeria with a highly av uh, with a TCR with high avidity, but in the case of a low avidity, you needed about 5,000 T cells being transferred. And when they move into a into a tumor model, I think this is what I where I really want to get to, is that they again have these different avidities, and they show that if you transfer these TCRs as a polyclonal population, you don't see differences in their population how these TCRs expand or populate the the lymph nodes, the tumor. The differences are very difficult to see. The expansion on in the in the non-draining lymph nodes, and particularly in the blood, you don't see differences when it comes to the expansion of these clones. Even though you know for a fact that they have very different protective capacity and very different avidities, which shows you that maybe looking for clonal expansion is not necessarily going to give you much information. And when it comes to another marker that is very highly used, which is PD1, they show that. In the case of cells in the tumor, cells that were isolated from the tumors in this mice, they have an MC38 uh, tumor model. They show that ex for the exception of maybe the low, very, very low avidity, there is it's really hard to differentiate T cells for uh, their avidity of T cells based on PD1 expression. However, if you look in the cells uh, that are in the blood, that's where this difference become apparent. And then you can identify to some extent the avidity of these TCRs relate how and how it relates to the PD1 expression, but only in the blood. We, and this suggests that PD1 could be used as a surrogate marker for TCRs with high protective capacity because they have a high avidity, but only if you look at them outside the tumor, not necessarily the ones that are inside the tumor, because they a lot of them express PD1 high uh, in general, possibly because of a high expression of the of the antigen in the tumor. They also look into human data and they uh, analyze antigens, new antigen-specific T cells from two patients with uh, melanoma, which were actually uh, samples that came from my institute. And again, they have uh, two particular new antigen mutations. They have two patients, and again, they look, try to find, compare the avidities of different TCRs that are specific against this new antigen and how they uh, they. And how they 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 identify the avidity by transferring these TCRs to uh, to T cells and comparing their their functionality, and again they see that um, they identify very subtle differences in the activation profile of these different avidities, but only in, in, in the T cells from blood. If they have uh, cells that have been activated, uh, if, for example, in a culture, and this, because these patients were treated with uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocyte uh, therapy, so these T cells were collected from the tail, from the tumor, and they were expanded and reinfused. But uh, what I think was very interesting is that they could identify, based on activation, uh, um, uh, activation signatures, cells in the, before the inf infusion of this tumor infiltrating lymphocyte uh, product. They can identify uh, high ability TCRs based on activation signatures before treatment. Um, I think it was the paper was very interesting because they did a lot of very deep work. I think it was a little bit hard to read sometimes because they did so many things trying to understand whether PD one it works as a as a marker for 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 uh, protection. And I do think that it's very interesting to see that. Uh, they used this model with very reductionist approach, and they got interesting results in mice that they could correlate with how they see in these human subjects uh, in, in melanoma. Um, and I think it, it adds to the idea that it's very hard, it's tumor uh, clonal expansion is not necessarily a good uh, measure of T cell uh, of tumor uh, um, of tumor specificity, especially if you see T cells within the tumor. But that there might be uh, a use for this marker in t, in t cells from blood, that they might be actually uh, useful for therapy. So, do you think this model would be something you'd want to think about employing, like something like this when in, in in like car type of work or something else where they can rap rapidly get the avidity? Well, I well they they do so for 
comparing the abilities, and I think this is very interesting. They have uh, so uh, Killian Schrober, one of the uh, senior authors, has a very nicely working system for uh, CRISPR mediated replacement of the TCR with any transgenic TCRs at physiological level. So they 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 knock in the 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 TCR that they're they're uh, screening, and it gets expressed at regular kind of uh, native TCR levels, which makes it easier to compare, I think, uh, fine grain, kind of c compare the small scale, the abilities between different TCRs. And I think that's something very interesting that I also uh, um, like to use in my own research because it's a little bit different to you in just transductions. So that's how he compares, for example, the abilities. And I think this this idea of, of using PD-1, or they also have activation signatures that they identified uh, for identifying actually uh, reactive clonotypes from the blood would be really nice because at the moment we don't really have a way of identifying active, reactive clonotypes from the blood. Uh, we assume that there's some activation markers that do the job, but it's it's really hard to pinpoint. You have so many TCRs in the blood. Uh, and just looking at the ones that are expanded doesn't seem to be the the the, the um, answer. Interesting. All right. Well, we will be talking to Dr. Leonardo Freire in a few moments. But before we get to that, um, if you want to decorate your lab, you should do so with the Nature's Protocol wall chart. It outlines the production of therapeutic CAR T cells from apheresis collection and T cell enrichment to gene modification, expansion, and delivery. Request a free copy of the wall chart at Stem Cell Technologies T Cell Therapy Resource Center by visiting www.stemcell.com slash T hyphen cell hyphen therapy. Welcome today to our guest. We are talking to Dr. Leonardo Ferreira. He is assistant professor of microbiology of immunology at the Medical University of South Carolina. And he's going to be talking to us about a topic that is very dear to my heart. So all those listeners, all those listeners will know. Because Leo, just as I, is really into T-Rex, aren't you, Dr. Ferreira? Yes, uh, the, the regulatory T-cell. Uh, I even wrote a love letter to them at some point last year. <laughs> <laughs> so we've talked T-Regs before, but you have an interesting angle on it, which I, which I call as a car T-Reg, essentially. So high level, when I think T-Regs, I think specific antigen presentation recognition on them to tamp down things. How the heck does that work with the CAR T reg, given that outside of some weird stuff like celiacs, we really struggle to know the antigen that is needing to be generating tolerance for, for therapy. So, so how do you get there with CAR T regs as a thing? Well, I think that's the beauty is that, I think you don't need to know the cognate antigen, the causal antigen of the disease to design a CAR T-reg. Let's say you want to protect beta cells from attacking type 1 diabetes. Uh, what you want, or one of the things you want is to redirect, to drive the T-regs to go to the islets and protect them. You don't need to know what antigen, what epitope T-regs usually see. You just have to make a car that drives them to the right place. So part of the beauty of Tregs, you know, they have bystander suppression and infectious tolerance. And so those two properties, once they are in the right place at the right time, they get to do the right thing. So I would argue that that's one of the beauty of the CAR chimeric antigen receptor platform for Tregs. You don't need to know what the natural antigen is. Some people will fight me on this, but that's what I think. So you just need to bring them to the right place at the right time. And as long as they're there, they're doing their job. This is part of what I think. So uh, for type 1 diabetes, for example, there are still studies undergoing, like what's the composition of islets in healthy versus type 1 diabetics at different stages of the disease, right? So the disease progresses, you have less and less islets to look at. But even then, some islets have a lot of infiltrates, a lot of T cells in them, and others don't. So the, the, there's some mystery there. Also, why, you know, now with the advent of single cell sequencing, you can do all, all this analysis to show that you know, sometimes people, you know, they've lived with diabetes for decades and they still have some beta cells. What makes those different from the ones that died? So there's also some research on the, the beta cell side. How are some beta cells different from others that some survive and some don't? Is it stochastic? 
is there something there? But, but so in general, you know, the, the concept of bystander suppression is that if you have the Treg in the right place, it will secrete cytokines such as IL-10, IL-35, TGF-beta, and it will also re-educate uh, antigen-presenting cells, sometimes even kill them, um, to really re-educate, to remodel that microenvironment. So the idea then that without the cognate antigen recognition, it's not as good, but it's good enough, essentially? Yeah. So that's a good question. If it's so, I'm actually trying to see this myself. So I'm looking to to do a, a characterization of CAR T reg signaling versus endogenous TCR C28 signaling. And I think that's because, in part, you know what you mentioned in general, the CAR looks very different from a T cell receptor. Uh, and one reason why is because the affinity of an antibody, which is what drives CAR recognition, is very different from the affinity of a natural T cell receptor. And so that there'll be differences in uh, affinity and in dwelling time as well. I think with a car, a car T-reg might spend more time bound to a target cell than a natural T-reg. And so there's stuff like trogocytosis, right? Comes from Greek, trogo means to nibble. Uh, and so you will hear about T-cells and K-cells or immune cells taking pieces out of other cells. And T-regs do this, right? With CTLA-4 attaching to CD8 and CD86 from the APC, and it kind of emasculates it, so really, really educates the dendritic cell that now it becomes, instead of being pro-inflammatory, becomes uh, tolerance-inducing. And so I wonder if the CAR is also doing some, something similar. And so I don't know if a CAR T-reg is better or worse at suppressing a specific immune response than a natural T-reg. I think that that's an open question. I saw that some of your research, you actually saw some unexpected behavior of CAR T regs, in which they actually seem in a in a model of a tumor model, they seem to actually be uh, also directly uh, in inhibiting tumor growth. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about that? And were you surprised? Yes, and I still am. So this uh, so the idea here was we wanted to have a model as simple as possible to test. CAR T reg mediated suppression. So what cells grow really well? Cancer cells. We have cancer cells, we have a, we have a C19 directed CAR, and we have C19 expressing cells. So, okay, just put a C19 CAR in a T reg, see if that works. And it did. You know, the T regs, they remain FOXP3 and Helios positive, uh, that they proliferate, uh, that they suppress T cells proliferation in vitro. So, all, you know, you can uh, cross all the T's, dot all the I's. But then when it comes to the in vivo stuff, that's when the interesting part and the surprises really came. And one of them was, you know, if you put these CAR T regs at CC19, which is 19 expressing tumor cells, they actually interact quite well to the point that the CAR T regs now, yes, they do remain T regs, but they also have heightened uh, production of interferon gamma, TNF alpha, granzyme B, perforin. So I think it goes a bit to the previous question, which is how is the CAR? Are the CAR T regs as good as natural T regs? Better, worse? Do they have new functions even? Because uh, I was looking, I compared two signaling domains, uh, 28 zeta, 4 BP zeta. These are kind of the you know vanilla and chocolate flavors of the CAR T cell therapy that is FDA approved. And if you compare those two and other people as well, now published, you see differences in T regs that you don't see in effector T cells. So that's also one thing I learned that the hard way, if you will, is that whatever difference you see in different flavors of CAR T cells in conventional T cells need not apply to T regs. You have to repeat the work uh, in T regs and see what happens. And so, yeah, there's some findings were surprising indeed. And so you'd imagine that not being great because, uh, you know, let's say I drive a CAR T reg to the eyelids to protect them. The, the last thing I would want is for this CAR T reg to go to that site of inflammation and actually contribute with some inflammatory cytokines. Uh, so, for example, TNF alpha, they are. Uh, drugs, medicines that target TNF alpha for diabetes. So we know that TNF alpha is bad news in T1D, and we have a ton of receptor and others precisely that block that. So you wouldn't want to inject cells that make more of that bad molecule, if you will. So along those lines, then, with, with kind of where we're at in the knowledge, CAR T cells are out. Yay, huzzah. <laughs> How far behind do you think are CAR T regs? Is this 10 years down the line, five years down the line? 20 years down the line and the manufacturer is not going to be that hard because we can kind of already do it for for regular t-regs we have a regulatory pathway now or for car t-cells rather 
but like how much more work do you think needs to be done in that translational space before we can really start getting into the clinic significantly? I want to be optimistic and say five years, but I'll tell you why. I was at this T-Rex summit. There's really a conference called T-Rex summit, by the way, that I was honored to give a talk at in May in Boston. And there's actually not only academia, but also many companies, many startups uh, that are working in this space. And I was very surprised how far they've come. You know, some of them, even they make synthetic T-Rex, you know, you force expression of FOXP3 and Helios. And if you, you know, do gene expression analysis, they kind of look similar, they work similar, but it was a lot of it was in vitro or undisclosed. But I really liked the talk by someone who is as a German scientist, you know, we live to the Germans to be blunt and cut through the chase. He basically says something that amounts to, if this field as a whole doesn't work in the next five years, I think we're all out of business. Because uh, I remember I wrote a review with my postdoctoral advisor, Jeff Bluson and QC Tong at UCSF in 2019, when I posted on Twitter, you know, very happy, very proud. And someone commented, T-Rex, forever in phase one. And so this is the feeling in a field. You know, I'm giving a talk with Everett Meyer next, next month, uh, a webinar, and he has data on phase three T-Rex for Graffer's disease. So the work is being done, but you know, it's few and in, in far apart. But I think over the next half decade, something has to happen. I think there's been really an inflection point with new companies like uh, Quell and Sonoma and TXL. And so I want to be optimistic and say next half a decade, we'll see big differences in all these different targets for transplant, uh, for for IBD as well. So I I want to say five years, but of course, it's going to be more like 20 to see the full potential. But I hope that at least in five years, we'll see either this approach works or not, because you know, these cells can be fragile, as you know, they become T factor cells or they just die altogether. So that there's a, and then I'll stop talking but just very quickly for the manufacturer. Yes, the path has been laid, but uh, one, T regs are much more rare than T conventional cells. So I've seen myself or been, yeah, I've been seeing that some trials actually stop because time after time, you can't make enough cells to inject the people with. You don't meet the target dose. So there's actually quite some challenge there in things as simple as just growing enough t rex mm. But I can imagine, as you mentioned, the issue with the manufacturer, because it is, as you said, not that easy to expand T-Rex, like functional T-Rex to millions and millions and billions of cells that we do with conventional T-cell products. And do you think that is that something that uh, it has to do, what do you think is the main issue that with that kind of the stability of this T-Rex, why, why can't, why do we seem to lose them as we try to expand them? That's a good question. I, because people try different things, you know, the sorting. So one difficulty is that there's no unique cell surface marker for T-Rex. And that might be actually the biggest difficulty, because if you don't know what to start with, you know, people will say garbage in, garbage out. And then I don't think the T-Rex field is like that. But the sorting part, you know, uh, we do C25 versus CD127, and we try to be as stringent as possible, even at C45RA. So then we have naive T-Rex, which grow way better. It's like 10 times different. I've tested this. 100 labs have tested this, so nothing new here. But in any case, so we are getting better at uh, sorting them to start with. But still, uh, yeah, they just have these dangers and difficulties that conventional T-cells don't. Usually don't worry as much about your T-cells in culture stop being T-cells. But T-Rex, yes, they do stop being T-Rex. If you do your FOXP3 versus Helios 2D staining, then you start seeing a population creeping out that is double negative or at least single negative. Uh, and so why is it difficult? I think it's a, it's, it's a mix I think T-Rex naturally divides slowly. And so all these in vitro artifices simulate them to divide fast. Uh, and so that might actually be something that maybe we are violating the very nature of T-Rex and you know, something gives at some point. So that, that could be one explanation. It's a bit hand waving and, <laughs> and not very hopeful, but it could be that we're just you know, somehow changing the biology of T-Rex so much in vitro. Because one thing is that Sometimes you see some autoimmune diseases, for example, they find mutations that make sense that to lead to T-reg defects. And so, okay, these people maybe have the same number of T-regs or frequency or both, but their T-regs, each one of them works worse. But then we put them in vitro and they work just fine because we give them so much IL-2, a 96 12 round bottom with just the right number of effector cells to suppress. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I think there's some biology there. 
but as technology just keeps improving, you know, better media composition, it's actually a shame it's so hard and expensive to make, uh, you know, a select medium, but there's been some progress, right, in serum free medium and so on. So I actually have quite some hope for that, for just making better media to grow these cells. So kind of continuing on, and you, you talked about the struggles industry, are you thinking of getting involved in the biotech scene at all on the side while being in academia with what's going on? <laughs> It's a good question. I mean, I'm very academic in the way I am and the way I think, but at the same time, in immunology, you have to try really hard not to be translational. And so I have uh, seven patents now of which four have been licensed, but have I ever entered the company that licensed them? No. So I don't know what they're doing with them. I hope they're doing good work. But so the, I don't know, I just see myself as more, I always worry at the personal level then in industry or in biotech, you kind of you have a great idea that is very applicable of a product. And then you're married to it. And so if it goes down, you go down. And then if it goes up, you know, you become what the next, you know, Elon Musk or something. But I think in academia, I kind of like the, you know, bouncing back and forth ideas. I have 10 ideas, nine of them fails. One is all right. So we keep going on that one. I kind of like that freedom. I think by the time it gets to a product, I'm already over it. I'm already on the next discovery. Like I like discovery phase, you know? So it's a bit like you have uh, the guy who discovered DNA and the guy who cloned the first gene. Both extremely important, right? But very different, right? If you clone insulin, that's very important in cell. But the guy discovered DNA, I mean, yeah, that's interesting, but only was discovered how important it was, you know, we're still working on DNA, right? And so I see myself as the guy who tinkers and discovers DNA than the guy who clones the first gene and makes a billion bucks. But that's for now. Uh, of course, uh, I think in the end, companies are what brings products to people. And it's also it's the ultimate lab, you know? The, the lab is the world at that point. And so I kind of like, so again, from this T-Rex summit I went to, I like the mix of academia and industry because there's actually a lot of rigor in science industry because like, hey, there's $50 million on the line and people's lives. And so I, I really liked that uh, really low tolerance for, you know, things are nebulous, not clear. So I, I kind of like that rigor. So it is important. Uh, I appreciate the, the work and the rigor that goes into taking things into people. Well, it's, there's a lot of people already working on that. So maybe you can relax and keep working on the discoveries. <laughs> I mean, your, as you mentioned, your, your former advisor, uh, Jeff Bluestone actually moved no, to work to yes. or actively Uh, working on Sonoma uh, Therapeutics, he talked to us, uh, we talked with us about it uh, back in some episode some time ago. But it's really, I mean, it's really cool, as you said, the rigor. And I also have some, like, have some kind of experience seeing how how companies work. I and mean, there is something very exciting about that, like very high pace, very focused on the one problem. And there's, I sometimes that can be also very, I don't know, very interesting. I have a question. So going back to the science then, because I had to say I'm very interested about how, as you mentioned, how do we bring the, the, the T-Rex to the right place? Um, you also have some work on, uh, I think you, you also mentioned it, using T-Rex to prevent transplant and rejection. So you've, in that case, you are, for, you have, we, we use different types of targets. What, what are other, so maybe we can discuss a little bit about what do you think is the, 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 the promise or How how good do you think this might work targeting uh, the HLA alleles of of a transplant or something like that to prevent rejection as a different? You we mentioned type one diabetes, but I guess there's so many diseases that can be targeted that way. Yes, and I think so. So transplant is of course a prime target for T Rex. I think it will be a case where T Rex will be perhaps not sufficient, but a nice addition to it because there's so uh, there's such a large frequency of alloreactive T cells in anyone. Uh, it seems to be additive too. Uh, there's some work from Megan Sykes at Columbia University and others. And so I think there, uh, no matter how many T-Rex you inject, I think you also need to deplete the effector cells. And so actually Sonoma and others, they have also you know, T cell depleting agents. And so I think it'll be a combination of depleting uh, you know, aggressive T cells and then providing T-Rex, but that would be That's how actually I got started in and my PhD. I worked in HLA lab, Jack Strominger, who literally crystallized HLA-A2 back in the 80s. And so I feel HLA always follows me 
throughout my entire career at this <laughs> point, I feel like, because he crystallized a chile to our to HLA G when I was in his lab, which is a non-classical molecule at the maternal fetal interface responsible for local tolerance. And my postdoc part of my work was uh, being involved in HLA2 car. Uh, we made this grafted HLA2 car fully humanized. And then we show the, in a mouse model, humanized mouse model, the anti traffics to human islets and they prevent graft resistance disease. And so that, that's a field of transplants is obviously it's a prime target. And I know that TXL is a trial on this with CAR T Rex uh, in, in the transplant. And so I think this will definitely be a good example. And I think it goes back to the very beginning of our conversation because in transplant, we know exactly what the antigens are. There's no doubt that the HLA alleles are the target to go after. And from biology, I think is also really interesting because T regs are HLA class two restricted. But if I make an HLA two car T reg and actually I do a knock in, so I replace TCR with a car, uh, now I have an HLA class one restricted T reg. Uh, but it's but same machine independent at the same time. But so I think it's just, uh, there's also some poetry there almost. How <laughs> I always like to think of synthetic immunology, uh, not just knowing the rules very well, but also bending them. No? So now we have T cells with B cell molecules expressing their surface of the car. And now CD4 T cells are seeing MHC class one through some other receptor. And maybe we can do a payload that is usually found in macrophages or, you know, I really like that mix and match just again the, the color palette and, and try new things with the immune cells. That's what I like about immune system in general. It's very programmable and it's everywhere in your body. Uh, and so yeah. I think those are two powerful properties that really made me fall in love with the immune system early on in my PhD. Indeed. I also think I agree with the synthetic immunology also is very interesting because information, I think in a way it's so important to the information. It has such a, uh, such an important role. And then by changing information, one of the things you can really change with synthetic immunology, you get different signalings. If you can generate different signalings that give the cells particular signals, then it's you just change the whole behavior in a very predictable manner. It's very interesting. What do you think, Jason? I see you very... <laughs> well, this is why the Treg is my second favorite immune cell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it? Is it the first yeah. time I hear this? We've never asked past the first ever before. We never got to the ranked <laughs> order list discussion. Well, what's the third? Sorry, let's just get this right, over so with. The third would probably be a cytotoxic T cell. Okay. And then a fourth is the ILC3. Yeah, I guess the cytotoxic T cells, they do get some merit. But they're kind of important. <laughs> kind of. You, you can't slightly. take the infantry and like say they're not important and not have them in a top five list. Otherwise, it, it, you know, come on. <laughs> Yeah, it would be a very sad army. It would be, right? <laughs> yeah. I got all these cool specialized soldiers. No front line. Uh-oh. Well, you always have like neutrophils. They go and kill themselves for the, yeah. for the cost. I don't know. Neutrophils are on the bottom of the list because I can't culture them with crap. They always die whenever you look at them. So. But that's what they do. I know. <laughs> that's they the whole point. You. <laughs> they die when you extract them. They die when you look at them. They die on Wednesdays more than Tuesdays, apparently, in the lab. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Can we ask you, Leonardo, do you have uh, a top three favorite, uh, favorite immune cells that you would you like to share? Uh, sure. I mean, I think the T-Reg will have to go number one. Fair uh, enough. But otherwise, I really like the, the natural killer cell. It acts like a rheostat, right? It's always a balance of how um, much activation, how much inhibition, and the cure. Are they important or not? I used to work with the German postdoc that he said, I just want to knock out all the cures and prove that they're not important. That was kind of a project in the back of our minds to so just knock out the entire cure locus and figure out whether it's important or not. And so, so in case I will come number two, and also at the maternal fetal interface, natural killer cells are actually the most abundant uh, yes. lymphocytes. So it's an inverted ratio from peripheral blood. And AHLAG inhibits in case cells. So it all kind of go, comes together nicely. And then the number three, uh, maybe, yeah, I think the cytotoxic T cell will come num number three. Uh, because it's just kind of the thing is just beautiful. The, these T cells, they make the immune synapse and they release their cytotoxic granules. Uh, I think it's just a cool function that there's a cell whose function is to kill other cells. I, I don't know if there's any other, I guess the macrophage also engulf, uh, but like a cell that is a, a killer cell, 
Right, it's got some lasers that shoot out from it. It doesn't just eat things. It blows them up. Yeah, it's yeah. Great. Little okay. missiles. What are your other two, Brenda? We know yours are T-cells, T-cells. Yeah, what are your top two? Uh, <laughs> I read, mm. Well, I, I have to say, I also do like the NK cells very much. I haven't worked with them almost at all in my life, but they always seem to pop up in the most unexpected places. And they, and they, they can do like things differently. They do their own, their own thing. And I, I am very, I am a very kind of preaching or like, I really like TCR specificity and tumor recognition. Like, but then NK cells, they, they do, they, they use a completely different set of signals to, to work. And I, and I do respect that. I think it makes the system more redundant. I like it. So I would also go for NK second. And then my third, uh, my third cell, I think it has to be the macrophage. That's great. <laughs> you know, they're just there taking care of everyone's leftover. You know, they, they are the ones that show up after everything else is done. And I, and I respect that. So I, I guess that would be my third. And they were the first immune cell, right? It was uh, was matching up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. They are even in sponges. So clearly. Yeah, that's true. They clearly have a long line, a very lustrous line of existence. So <laughs> respect, respect to the phagocytes. Um, I wanted to ask you now that also that I was very interested. You, you know, you and your postdoc, you're also very active in kind of community outreach, and you had a a program for uh, teaching science in Latin America. I think is is that am I correct? Yes, uh, Club is a Ciencia Bolivia, Science Clubs Bolivia. So, uh, so the movement itself started in Mexico, uh, and then it really spread like wildfire. So Mexico, Colombia, Bolivia. So uh, Mohamed Mostajo was my classmate, uh, was executive director for the Bolivian one. He's from Bolivia, and so I guess uh, looking back, it was really great time and experience because it was uh, we're all we're all classmates, and so some are from Mexico, some are from Bolivia, some are from Colombia, and so on, and so it really went. To, to almost 10 countries total. And it's really something I always looked forward to in January, because every January for five years, uh, I would fly out of, of United States, uh, first year Boston, then four years San Francisco. Uh, July, January 1st, I would fly out uh, down to Miami and then uh, in Bolivia, there's no direct flight. And we'd spend there almost two weeks. And uh, we went up to 400 students. So these are late high school, early college students. Uh, so up to 400 of those. And we had 17 courses. I was instructor of one of them. And the president of Bolivia herself came to the closing ceremony in the one in 2020. So it's actually hard to believe, but January 2020, before the whole lockdown <laughs> happened, there were 500 of us, 500 of people in the same building, taking a group photo and doing all these, you know, team building activities and classes and lab. It was, it was pretty intensive because it's only a week. So the morning is lecture. And the afternoon is lab. So in my lab was, I call it rewriting life. Uh, it was about CRISPR-Cas9 and also some immune cell engineering. And we know we got everybody's DNA, ran a PCR, ran a restriction digest. Uh, we had a CRISPR kit from Josiah Zayner from the Odin. He now moved to Austin. He's living in San Francisco. So I knew him personally uh, where, you know, can do CRISPR to uh, edit uh, antibody resistance gene mm-hmm. in bacteria. So you can see very, you know, black and white results. So, you know, in, in one week, we kind of did it all. PCR, DNA, CRISPR. Uh, so it was a really great experience. At that. I think it's important because they say in Latin, right, that by teaching, you learn. And for me, that couldn't be more true. I think the questions that, that these kids, I guess, ask you, uh, they, they're very different from questions that reviewers ask you, that people at conferences ask you, that your advisor or now, you know, other, co- or other colleagues ask you. So I think it's important. Uh, to keep that passion for science alive and being always open to new and fresh questions. So it's really a great experience those five years. So are you able to do more of that now that the pandemic is winding down? Well, that's a good question. So I know that with the, with the, with the Bolivian version, it hasn't happened again. Uh, with the Mexican one, I know that it's some online version of it, but I don't think it's the same. I mean, I, I hate to be this old person, but uh, he has to be in person. We literally, the whole slogan of the thing is that we are flying scientists from, you know, Harvard, UCSF, you name it, down to Santa Cruz, La Sierra, Bolivia. They're going to teach you for a week. We had, you know, 2000 applicants. We picked 300 and then more as we got more funding and more space. I think that that was a big appeal of it. I mean, maybe I self-serving, but the big thing was that we're all together for a week and we see, oh, the scientists, they're, they're people just like us. 
you know, they have interests, they, they, you know, they walk around us, they, they teach, they also have fun, uh, they do science, they have struggles, a lot of struggle. And so I think that in-person components is hard to capture if you're doing online only. Uh, yeah, that's very interesting. I, I, who, how did you guys fund this? Did you get funding from, who helped you like fan and finance all these trips and all these activities? Yeah, it was a mix. And really, my, my friend Mo, uh, Mosaho, he's really a genius at this. I mean, we, we got grants from the State Department. We got help from local banks and brands. I remember there'll be booths of like, like uh, Choco Likes and like local uh, chocolate drink company and so on. So yes, uh, we got funding through really reaching out to as many partners as possible. Also some government funding. Uh, we even had a session that I wasn't part of. I'm not an American citizen. There's a session in Washington, D.C. that was a mix of American citizens and Bolivian descendants, uh, American citizens in, in D.C. And so, yeah, the program. And they also had the, well, the hackathon, actually, or a version of it. So that, that was, I was also, again, not part of it. So it really was branching out. And then every, during the week, at the end of the week, we had a series of seminars that were open to the public. So not only the high school and college students that were selected uh, benefited from it, but also the local community could attend the, the talks. Uh, so, so those I'll give one, and uh, I think it was 10 talks total about different talks I'll work. So, so this was a program that became over the half a decade, uh, since no small amount of time, but it got very mature. So it was really a shame that the pandemic kind of put some cold water on it. And then, you know, next thing you know, uh, I moved, uh, Mo moved, another Omar also moved. So he moved to New York City. Mo moved to Santa Cruz, I moved to MUSC. And so kind of the original seven, I think there were seven of us at the beginning, we've all moved on uh, to different jobs and different locations. But it was excellent programming. Uh, it should definitely be repeated. Uh, let's see how this all traveling. I think now the restrictions are over, but now there's monkeypox. And so I don't know if that's gonna be a thing as well. It just never ends. <laughs> oh my God, it just no, never ends. No, no. <laughs> No. You heard you heard it your first listeners. Monkey box is no. gonna <laughs> doesn't transmit that well. Stop. All right. No, Sorry, anyway. we live in denial. We just we just don't want yeah. to know. We're gonna have polio in the U.S. That's oh yes, uh, yeah. Well, told me because apparently, so I I was vaccinated for uh, polio, mm -hmm. and so was one of my lab members was not born in the U.S. But two of my other lab members were born in the U.S. and. I know they're born in 2000s. I don't even know anymore. I don't keep track, but they, <laughs> but, but they don't have it, right? So they were scared that there were cases in New York because they don't have the vaccine for it. So, were, uh, I mean, I was vaccinated for polio in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, that was like ancient history, it used to be a Jason. Thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know. I'm getting old. Fine. <laughs> All right. Well, that depends by country. I mean, my lab member yes. got vaccinated. He's 21 years old, but he was not born here, right? So he got the vaccine elsewhere. All right. Well, we're running out of time and I'm getting depressed and apparently I'm old. So we're going to jump to the uh, the fun question at the end and avoid discussing my age. So <laughs> the question for you is, what is the best piece of advice you've ever gotten? It can be professional, it can be scientific, it can be unrelated to science or your profession or anything, but the best piece of advice you've ever gotten that you want to pass on? Oof, that, that's a hard one. Okay, can I give, can I say two? Sure. And I'll keep it brief. So, so one of them was from my PhD advisor, Jack Strominger. He, he turned 97 years old, August 7th. His past August 7th was a Sunday. He still runs a lab. And he started his lab when he was 26 years old because he went to college during World War II and med school. So everything was accelerated. He was at the NIH at his own lab, work on whatever he wants. And so anyway, from someone who had a lab for, uh, you know, for 60 years, <laughs> what he always told me is like, is it fun? Only do it if it's fun. Uh, and now, and so I think what he meant is that if you're not passionate about it, you know, the years will just go by and you're just living miserable and you don't feel satisfied because uh, science is so hard. That's why I tell everyone joins my lab. Science is very hard. Also, science is a team sport macroscopically, but individually, macroscopically, it's the one person has to keep track of things and drive the project. But so anyway, so I think this whole like only do it if it's fun. I think that was really my favorite advice. And the other one I was going to say is in the same line. Someone told me, you know, don't just survive, also thrive. So if you're just surviving just to buy yourself another survival cycle, then it's not worth it. Then step back and reassess that. It's from my good friend, I was in Gersten in, up in Boston. And so I think those two only do if it's fun and don't just survive, thrive. Those are the best 
advice I've gotten, which sometimes we're so down in the weeds, we're stressed, deadlines, things to do. Yeah, but that's important, uh, you know, get the job done. Everybody's got to survive, but also don't forget to, and I think that's why the teaching is important because then you're in front of these people, you're like, okay, what do I do again? You know, what, what's my very broad job description? Why do I wake up every day? Where am I, what am I going to go next? That does not involve in how many R1s I'm going to submit, how many papers I have in submission. No, it's much bigger than that. And so I kind of like those piece of advice to just, you know, just only do things that are fun. <laughs> I think that's great advice. That definitely gives gives you the energy to keep at it. You need to take it from yes. somewhere. Indeed. Are are you thriving, Brenda? I am. I mean, right now I'm a little bit tired. It's kind of late under this in this uh, time zone, but I do try. I think it's important. But as you said, it's very easy to get kind of distracted by all the immediate things and all the things that need to be done and all the. And academia nowadays, as many people point out, can be a little bit of a hamster wheel that it really is. is <laughs> uh, can be tough to, well, there's not a lot of space to stop the wheel to take a moment sometimes, I feel, as a young investigator myself. And, uh, but well, I think you are completely right. In the end, you have to enjoy it and you need to find something that helps you thrive. I, I think we're all smart people and we should use that smart in a way. Well, on that point, thank you very much for coming on and talking to us about uh, Brenda's favorite T cell. Thank you so much. <laughs> I've been great. And I wish you a lot of success with your with your lab. So you've been uh, assistant professor for over a year now at and current. And how how is it? How how do you feel? How any any short advice for other young PIs? Hmm. I think the team is very important. Like I've been lucky that MUSC has many programs in place. So there's a PhD program, but also, you know, uh, medical students get some time off to the research and even undergraduates. And so I've been lucky that people that I've, I've come in contact with, they are pre-selected. And for me as a, you know, because no one knows who I am, let's be honest, as a, as a PI anyway. And so for me to hire someone more senior or like out of the blue, I personally, I'm a bit scared. But if mm -hmm. it's someone who like uh, reaches out to me, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm a first year PhD student, could I rotate in your lab? Or like, oh, I'm so-and-so, I, I need to do my senior thesis. So I had a, one of my lab members who is not a technician, he did his uh, college thesis with me and he was actually excellent. He worked in labs before. And so that would be one thing, really use and abuse your network and <laughs> just a previous you know, validation recommendation. You know, Again, I think PhD programs, they're great because it's people, if they made it past the, uh, you know, the, the exams and the application interviews, you know, they really, and then when they join your lab, they're stuck with you, quote unquote, for four or five years. And so that'll be maybe my advice is like, really try to surround yourself with people that are invested, have skin in the game. For example, if it's a technician or a shorter, that's okay. Do they want to go to medical school or PhD? Good, because they will want to do well to get a letter from you and to learn from you before their next step. So always speak people with ambition because, the PI, he always has ambition. That's why I started a lab and like in the hamster, as you mentioned, but also make sure that your people also have ambition on their own. It shouldn't be just you telling them what to do or do this because I want it to. They also want to have to want it. So I think I'm from the line of thought that, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, that being uh, dedicated and passionate comes from inside. It can be helped, right? It can be helped to flourish. It can be maximized, but it has to be there already, that seed. And so that, that'll be my maybe very broad advice. But so when you surround yourself, also at the beginning, every lab member counts because they have limited money, limited time. So again, I think really pick out uh, the most passionate and invested people you can get through connections, through programs, whatever it is. Yeah. People, 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 people. <laughs> Number one rule of any, any group, people. Yeah, for sure. Right. So people. Thank People. you so much for today, <laughs> for our conversation. It's been great having you on the show. And we're looking forward to see your lab's uh, research published. Have a great um, afternoon in your case. Thank you for having me. That brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.immunologypodcast.com to get the show notes, including an episode summary and link to all the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Podcast or by email at info at immunologypodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests. See you next time. <laughs>